Well, it's lovely to be here, and it's especially lovely to be here when uh, Andrew and Nice and the family are here with us as well. Uh, I could tell you lots of stories about uh, how we met and how we uh, sat down with Andrew when he was still single and thinking about the future. We had breakfast together. <laughs> but isn't it wonderful how God does family? And uh, that's God's plan, his way. You know, sometimes the families that we are born into don't do a great job for whatever reason. We feel rejected by our fathers or mothers. Some people are, are left orphaned. And, uh, uh, and we'll be hearing stories more about that from Thailand, I'm sure. And yet, somehow, God brings us together in, in family, even in this family here. It was a, a lovely line in the collect today, which I thought, oh, oh, I hadn't heard that before, that we would dedicate our freedom to your service. Dedicate our freedom to your service. It sounds like a, a bit of a paradox, isn't it? Our freedom. We, we dedicate to his service. And he gave up his freedom, if you like, in order to serve us. So there are a, a couple of main themes in in what I want to speak about today. Um, and they're authority and servanthood. Again, seem a little bit paradoxical, opposites almost. And yet we'll see how they came together in the life of Jesus. Interestingly, the history of Father's Day, I had to look it up. I thought, well, where is this all coming from? And in the UK, it dates back more than a century and has evolved over time to become what we, we know of it as today. But it wasn't made official in the UK until 1972. Um, well, you've noticed that in, in popular TV culture, particularly um, you know, in uh, Britain and America anyway, from programs that you see, uh, cartoons particularly, fathers are often caricatured as buffoons or out of touch or not to be taken seriously, whether it's Homer, uh, you know, in The Simpsons, um, or if you've watched Peppa Pig, the father in that um, series, who doesn't even seem to have a name, um, is, is, is rather like a, a bit of an idiot, really. And, uh, and then there are similar examples in things like South Park and Rugrats and all those kinds of programs. And often the depictions are of lazy, gluttonous, irresponsible, accident-prone, and clueless men bumbling through life and taking no responsibility for their children. You know, basically, boys who never grew up. Uh, if that's a bit close to the bone for some of us, and uh, some of you um, wives and mothers sitting there thinking, well, that's pretty much accurate, um, <laughs> then, you know, it makes uncomfortable viewing for those of us who are fathers or grandfathers who are only too well aware of our flaws. And, and maybe I'm going a little bit too far in suggesting that there are some elements in society that would consider fathers as almost entirely irrelevant or superfluous and that families might be better off without them. We're also, um, you know, we have difficulty with father figures perhaps because of our own experiences personally, fathers who left during our childhood, or were just absent or distant anyway, emotionally, or perhaps worse still, they were abusive, or we never actually knew them. So father is a loaded word for many of us. And maybe, yeah, it, it does make me wonder if the undermining of parental authority is part of a wider attempt to undervalue all forms of authority attitudes towards anybody actually in a position of authority during my lifetime seems to have um, reached an all-time low, whether it's politicians or teachers, police officers, lawyers, religious leaders, or even your boss at work. And of course, even God is frequently disregarded and spoken of with disdain or outright contempt, hostility, or just dismissal. Western culture, perhaps in the late 20th century and early 21st centuries, is perhaps the first 
we're perhaps the first generation to seriously attempt to live as if there were no God. There may have been gods of some kind that people have tried to follow, but we, we've kind of, we think we've grown up enough to not need God anymore uh, in some circles. And it's not, we haven't got time this morning to go into why it is or how we got there. Suffice to say that authority itself seems to have got itself a bad name. It, it, is it because we confuse authority with authoritarianism, perhaps, and discount authority because of its frequent misuse? Maybe. By the time of Jesus' birth, political authority was being wielded by cruel Roman oppressors. Religious authority by power-hungry and xenophobic and legalistic control freaks. And examples were everywhere of power lording it over the powerless, the poor, the widows, and the orphans, and the disadvantaged for personal gain. So there weren't very many good examples of authority going on. And as humans, we have tended over the years to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So because people in positions of authority sometimes abuse their authority, we fail and, and fail to exercise it with kindness and goodness and gentleness. We have a tendency to reject the whole concept of authority. And we move closer and closer to anarchy, you know, where we don't want anybody to be in authority. And nobody wants to be in authority because it's such a, a horrible position to be in. I sometimes wonder, you know, we're coming up to an election and I'm thinking, are there any grown-ups in the room to elect? Uh, are there, you know, are we just going to elect the least worst? Probably, you know. The, the, the truth is, it's not an attractive position to step up into a place of authority, perhaps. Partly because we've misunderstood what authority is really about. Nevertheless, uh, without order, we have chaos. If we dispense with authority structures, we end up with anarchy and everybody doing what is right in their own eyes, a situation we see increasingly now um, where no one has the right to say anything is wrong or right. A school teacher, and I, I think there are a number here, uh, who has you know, no authority in a classroom, has a chaotic situ situation on their hands. No one benefits. And the same goes for a family or a, or a company or a government. So what really is this thing we call authority and what is the model for exercising it? At the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always to the end of the age. A rabbi in that culture at that time would gather disciples who would be with him, follow him wherever he was, would become like him and eventually go on to do what he did. On a number of occasions, we see Jesus modeling something starkly different to the prevailing culture, which was shocking to the Romans, to the Jewish leaders, and even to his disciples. Jesus tells his disciples that if they've seen him, they have seen the Father. If we see how Jesus lives his life, we will know what the Father is like. His character, his ways, his values, his priorities. So let's just briefly look at some of the characteristics of the way Jesus lived. From that passage in, in Philippians that uh, Jane read to us, we see that he took a position of a slave or a servant, the, the lowest in fact, those who washed feet, I think there were slaves that undid the sandals, and then that was, that was pretty low. But if you got to actually get your hands on somebody else's dirty feet, that was the lowest of the slaves. And Jesus modeled that to his disciples. Even though he was Lord and Master, as they recognized him as, he washed feet. He emptied himself or humbled himself 
of any notions of grandeur or equality to God. He gave up his rights. In fact, if you look at the life of Jesus, he grew up in the wrong side of the tracks. Nazareth was, oh, does anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, it was the wrong place to come out of in the eyes of the, the prevailing culture. There was a question mark probably over his legitimacy. Who was going to believe that really, yeah, the Holy Spirit came on Mary? Right. You know, he lived as a tradesman, economically poor in a country under Roman occupation, frequently misunderstood and misjudged. He laid down his life willingly for those he came to save, not looking out for himself. He then endured injustice and betrayal, denial, rejection, abandonment, violence, being mistreated and misunderstood, and continued to love unconditionally. This is an exercise of authority that we don't see many examples of in our day. And yet, this is the example of the authority that God is demonstrating through Jesus Christ and the authority that he is giving to us to go into the world with and make disciples of all nations. So if we're going to learn from a model of authority, it's Jesus we need to look at. What does this then mean for us, you and I as disciples of Jesus, in our calling to make disciples? What implications might this have um, for the way that we do family life or run a business or teach children in a classroom or, or do evangelism? Only do what he asks? Jesus said, you know, I only do what I see the Father doing. Be willing to do the humblest job. Not being afraid of rejection or being mistreated or misunderstood. Emptying ourselves of our own self-importance. Authority and leadership as Jesus models it in the kingdom he came to establish. It is about servanthood. So even though God is the supreme authority, he leads by serving, emptying himself, laying down his life. So from a kingdom of God perspective, being a father or a political leader or a business leader or a church leader, we lead by love and we lead by washing feet, living in the opposite spirit to the spirit of this world. I was thinking in, you know, in the beginning of the church, if you look at Acts of the Apostles, you look at Philip, and he was ministering in Samaria, probably a significant town, an important place, and people were coming to Christ, and there was lots of success in his evangelistic ministry, there were lots of miracles taking place, and then he was listening to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit says, go down the desert road. And you think, well, you know, I'm he could have said, well, I'm having a very successful ministry here in Samaria. What, this can't be God. But he says, go down the desert road. And he goes in obedience. He goes because he knows that submitting to Christ, submitting to the Father is, is the way, is servanthood, isn't it? And he goes and he, and he runs along and he meets one chap on a, on a chariot, an Ethiopian, and leads him to Christ probably the first African to become a Christian. Opens a whole new continent to the gospel because he was obedient, sensitive to what God was saying. So what about us? The Holy Spirit is sending us into the world to do what Jesus did, to reach out to people in this parish and in Thailand and beyond. How do we live out this example of servant-heartedness? I remember a time when I was uh, working in Bolivia as a missionary with Youth with a Mission, and um, I was quite young then, probably in my 20s, and uh, we went to this uh, village in the south of Bolivia called Entre Rios, and um, it was quite a hard place. People didn't really uh, take to having these strange people from another place coming among them to share the gospel with them. And, we did what we quite often did, and we set up something in the, 
in the town square and we tried to communicate the gospel with some drama and some theater and things like that. And people just just walked by and sort of pretty much ignored us. And we thought, what are we, what are we doing here? We haven't even asked God, what should we do? So we called a day, um, the team together, and we said, right, we'll, we'll pray, we'll fast, and we'll just go and walk around the village praying, like prayer walking, if you like, and trying to listen to what God might be telling us to do. Anyway, we came back after the day, and people shared their different things that they felt they got from the Lord. And one of them said, well, I've noticed that all the young people that we were trying to reach, you know, they, they all play football. Okay. That's noted. Okay, and then they said, yeah, somebody else said in the team, yeah, I felt we were supposed to be playing football. Okay, um, all right. So we, uh, we, we looked at ourselves and thought, you know, football. Yeah, we're, there's no footballers here among us particularly. Um, but why not? So we, uh, we put together a, fo a football team and uh, we went and found some of the young people and said, would you like to play uh, football, you know, against these strangers from another town. They said, oh yes, great. And virtually the whole village turned out to, uh, to play football. Uh, we, we lost, you know, astoundingly badly. Um, but we gained the opportunity to, to build a bridge with these youngsters. And then we were able to have conversations wherever we went in the village. Hey, you know, they'd, they'd call us over. Suddenly we gained an opportunity. We were humbled in our football uh, abilities, but for the gospel's sake, we gained a lot of opportunity. Small thing, but begin by asking, what are the needs of the people in our parish? What are the needs of the places we're going? And notice what God might be saying. In another place we went up in the, in the mining towns of Bolivia, it was... 5,000 meters altitude. Oh, not much oxygen up there, actually. And uh, where the, the life is very hard, life expectancy back in the 1990s, not very long ago, was about 45. Um, yeah, because of the, uh, the dangers of, of mining and so on. Anyway, very much a hard drinking, hard sort of culture. And um, the place was just full of rubbish and litter and it was just like people didn't value their own lives very much or anything else and uh, we went in and we decided well God what do we do here how do we relate to these people and we felt we were to pick up uh, a whole roll of um, ba black bags and begin by just picking up rubbish and we, we did that for several days and suddenly people were saying well, why are you doing this? Some of us were gringos, you know, from, uh, from Western countries and so on. Others were Bolivians and Argentinians and uh, Brazilians, all coming to this mining village. And, uh, and eventually we said, well, we love Jesus, we love you. The streets looked a bit untidy, so we thought we'd tidy them up. Come to the radio station. We want to. Well, we want you to share what, uh, what what you. We want to interview you. And suddenly we had a voice for the whole of that town. We start where we, you know, with what we have. Picking up somebody else's rubbish. May, we may feel, oh, I don't. Why should I do that? It's moving in the opposite spirit, isn't it, to the way, the spirit of the world. Um, how many stories I can tell, but anyway, one more, maybe one more. Um, when I first went to South America, it was in the 80s, and you may remember, some of you who are old enough to remember, we had a, a, a war with, the, with Argentina in 1982, and I was there about 1985, 1984, five. And the first time I, I went to Argentina, uh, I was invited to go and teach and uh, crossing the border between Bolivia and Argentina, I could see almost the border guards rubbing their hands with glee as they saw my British passport. And, and I crossed over the border with my young son, uh, James, who was about seven at the time. And uh, 
and the gods really wanted to make an example of me but just because of my nationality in that case and said right sit over there uh, you won't be uh, able to cross the border for uh, until the boss comes through and you know and I said well when's that likely to be oh maybe five six hours from now um, and we just had to wait and then he made a list of absolutely everything I had in my bag and and I was thinking, how I respond to all of this is going to be modeling something to my son. <laughs> do I get frustrated? Do I feel I'm being unjustly treated? Why should I be treated like this? Eventually, um, I did, you know, after my requisite five or six hours, I went and uh, spoke to them again. I said, is, uh, is your, uh, you know, your boss able to attend to me now? Oh, I, I think so. And you know, they, he came out of a room and signed off my visa to get, come into the country. They deliberately did it because all the buses leaving for Buenos Aires leave at five o'clock, and I was going to be seen after five o'clock so that I would miss all the buses going into the, the capital. So it was, you know, again, something to just make it difficult. How was I to respond with resentment, bitterness, anger, or in the opposite spirit. Uh, we eventually did get to Buenos Aires, um, uh, notwithstanding we, ha we had been robbed uh, on the way as well. <laughs> Another story. So everything was stacking up for us to have a very negative impression of being in this, in this country where I was supposed to be teaching a group of Argentinians um, you know, about discipleship and all this. So, and one morning, I think it was the last morning of the teaching, I went off to um, a park early in the morning and I found this uh, war memorial. And it was almost as if the Holy Spirit had taken me there. I didn't quite know where I was walking. I was just sort of walking in the morning. And, and I stood in front of this war memorial and it was to those Argentinians who were 17, 18, 19, who died in the Falklands War. And they had died because they were sent to the front, you know, to defend or, you know, to, to be in that war. Conscripts, many of them ill-equipped. And they were killed by British people with superior armaments and all the rest of it. And it didn't matter to me at that moment who was right and who was wrong in that situation. It grieved me that I was a British person in that place and that these young people had died and it was a British government or a British, you know, British people that had been involved. I felt somehow, am I going to take responsibility in some way? How do I take responsibility for that? And I asked the school leader if I could take the, the Argentinian students that I'd been teaching all week with me to this park and we got there to this war memorial. And I didn't know what to say. You know, at those times you need the Holy Spirit to tell you, don't you? And I began to open my mouth and, and, and just began to, to weep. I said, I am so, so sorry that young people, some of you, your neighbors or your cousins, your sons died uh, during that war. And it was a war between our two countries. Can we ensure that this, you know, would, can you forgive us as a nation, is what I said. I, I, what authority did I have to do that? I wasn't the government. I was just a 20-something-year-old person aware of the violence that had been perpetrated in that war for whatever reason. And one after the other, Argentinians would come and hug me and cry and said, I used to hate everything English and hate, you know. And, and I thought, we have diffused something of hatred here just by doing a small act of humbling ourselves and coming. And, and I thought, you know, how many more years of bitterness might have ensued with those young people towards another nation? We need to be able to draw a line, don't we, under... under hatred between nations, hatred between different religious groups and so on. Um, 
by humbling ourselves and looking for ways to, to serve in that way. Um, what would it look like then if we went out to serve and meet the needs of this community around us? It was graphic this morning as I walked into the room that uh, Eid was being celebrated right next door and many, many Muslims coming to, you know, just there. And our two communities. What is God saying to us about befriending those who are different to ourselves? Befriending the lonely, taking a meal round to somebody with limited mobility, inviting somebody over for coffee who was recently bereaved, cutting somebody's untidy lawn for them, I don't know. There are many opportunities that God gives us. Just a couple of weeks ago, um, we had Pentecost Sunday and we focused on the coming of the Holy Spirit as tongues of fire and uh, Sue had beautifully done these uh, tongues of fire hanging there behind us fluttering in the breeze and so on. One, and we focused on the power of the Holy Spirit, the gift of tongues, the power of signs and wonders. But perhaps just as importantly, when we live in Jesus and Jesus lives in us, we see the fruit of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are joy and love and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. In the early church, these were evident in the day-to-day -day life of the followers of Jesus. You know, if you read in Acts 2 what it was like, I'll just read a couple of excerpts. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. A little while later, all the believers were united in heart and mind. They felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. This is an outbreak of communism. Or, you know, and they shared everything they had. The, the apostles testified wonderfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. There was a, a real sense of sharing and, and doing equality, even though, you know, we often leave that to the government to sort out. What about us taking some initiatives? What would that look like? And I'm not going to give you the answers. I'm going to leave you with the question. You know, what does this look like for us as we become those who give radically generously, as we forgive generously. I came to Christ after reading a book about Corrie ten Boom, um, a wonderful Dutch lady who uh, sheltered Jewish people in her home during the Second World War and ended up in Ravensbrück uh, prison camp. And later on, there's a story at the end of the book where she met the commandant of that um, concentration camp in a church. He'd since become a Christian. And uh, he, Corey recognized him and so on. And, uh, and uh, there was an opportunity there to say, what does forgiveness look on this scale? We have the opportunity to forgive and draw a line under the abuses and the, and the horrors of the past, to give up our rights like Jesus, because all authority has been given to him on, in heaven and on earth, and we are sent in his name with that authority also. So we serve the needs of others, practice hospitality, protect the vulnerable, defend the oppressed, and strive for justice for them. Heal the sick and care for them. Teach them those in need of wisdom. Support and strengthen the weak. 
Respect and uphold the cause of the refugee, the exploited, the minorities living among us. And helping release those who are in prison, uh, prisons of fear and addiction and self-destructive behaviors. In the church, you know, there are no spectators, only participants. If you compare the analogy to a ship, there are no passengers, only crew. Yeah? I know the model of the world is that, uh, was it 10% of the people do 90% of the work? I hope it's not the same when we come as a community of believers, that we all are participants, we all have a part to play. I'm not putting on you a, a burden, you know, you should do more. <laughs> what I'm saying is that we all carry the responsibility of living like Christ. It's not Tim's responsibility or Wendy's responsibility or, you know, the PCC's responsibility. We also leave the 99 and go after the one that was lost. We, too, pick up our cross and follow him. And we take responsibility because he sends us. Let's pray, shall we? Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes to see what at the moment we miss. It might be there in plain sight, but we often miss the opportunity to give generously, sacrificially, the opportunity to support, the opportunity to listen, the opportunity to build bridges that make an opportunity to share the gospel. Father, help us to exercise the authority given to us by Jesus with a servant heart as prepared as you were to be the lowest of slaves, to have our rights, in inverted commas, overlooked in order to take responsibility, to not defend our own honor or defend our own cause, but to be willing to be overlooked and mistreated, even ridiculed as you were. I sometimes think of Paul and his companions in prison thinking about how wonderful it was that they had the opportunity to be beaten and, uh, you know, because of the name of Jesus. I don't know that I'd see it that way. Oh Lord, give us the willingness to, to, to step away from our own self-importance and uh, understand how you might be calling us to to be fruitful for you, to live in the, in the beauty of the fruit of the Spirit and in the power of the Spirit for your name's sake. Amen.